you greatly last week. Oh, you were well, not here. You know what? I didn't want to spread germs in case I had COVID. Oh, <laughs> oh you, you had it or you didn't have it? You're, you're not sure? Well, I, I don't get tested. Okay. So I you, don't no want my so you were not tested? Right? No, I don't. There's no more it. cold. It's just COVID. There's no cold. There's no flu. So. <laughs> Okay. You couldn't say you had the flu, and you right? told me you were <laughs> sick, and yeah. uh, you know I should have come to visit you. I mean, here the gospel. I'm, how can I yes. teach on this tonight? <laughs> I was sick, and you did not visit me. I didn't even get your address. I usually I mean, don't not, want not visitors. Is, with yeah. <laughs> you didn't want visitors. <laughs> I'm the same way. When I'm sick, I don't want any visitors. Yeah. What are you doing here? You should go and visit Alex. Oh, yeah. Alex who? The guy who had an accident. What's his last name? Uh, I have no yeah. idea who he is. Zarnas? Zarnas. 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 Yeah, he was. How old is he? 33. 33. 33. 33. 33. Wow. He got hit by a car, hit and run, on a bike. He was on his bike. Oh, my goodness. And he's very serious. Yeah, Gus Plank. Yeah, Gus Plank. very serious. They don't know if he's going to make it. Yeah. My That's really sad. Oh, yeah. Is he married or <laughs> children? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. What's, what's Lord his first name? Alex. 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 You better pray for him. Yeah, yeah. Everyone should do that. God, the prayer lists are glowing. Yes, yes, yes. She's ever to the Mayflower. Yes. So this is our second, second class for... The Teodion season, and I think uh, starting next week we'll have the pre-sanctified liturgies, but I don't think we're going to have anything to eat afterwards. I really doubt it. So we will continue to probably just teach here for about half an hour after the pre-sanctified liturgy. Yes. Do we know if we're going to eat after this pre-sanctified or no? I doubt it. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if you're going to be able to kiss each other at Forgiveness some, Sunday. I mean, yeah. you're not going to be allowed. We'll we have, just bow or something. Yeah, we have some. Maybe you have to be uh, at six feet away from each other oh. and just <laughs> bow to each other, you know, for, for Forgiveness Sunday. Terrible. We'll do our best. Terrible is not the word, but, but here on earth we have other people who give us directives. So, the book of Teodion, I should have brought it. It's a huge book. It's a wonderful book. And uh, every day it has amazing hymns. If you just, I have it in Greek, of course. And I will go through just a couple of the hymns, one from Monday, because there's services from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, actually, you know, for all times of the day. And you have all these beautiful hymns about repentance. And listen to this one from uh, Monday, this past Monday. The exterior doors, the prothera in Greek, the external doors of this arena are being opened for divine repentance. And let us enter cheerfully, not, oh my God, you know, the fast is coming. <laughs> cheerfully and this is repeated constantly in these hymns let us attack the fast with joy not with a defeatist attitude so let us enter cheerfully having purified our bodies by exercising abstinence from food and passions because the one leads to the other as obedient children offering a spiritual tithe to Christ who is calling the world to his heavenly kingdom. By doing this we will see his glorious resurrection with intense desire. 
So the church fathers speak about spiritual tithing, how we are supposed to give 10% of our income. The Jews did that in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, you know, we have no limits. We can give as much as 90% or if we don't have any money, then we give nothing. So it's not about money. This is about spiritual tithing. We have 365 days in a year. So we're going to take seven weeks of this year and we're going to fast very strictly for five days because Saturday and Sunday we don't really fast. We have oil. If you can use oil, you can cook all kinds of delicious, delicious foods. So five days each week we have a strict fast times seven, seven weeks, that's 35. And then we have Saturday, Holy Saturday. We have a strict fast, so not comes to 36. So we have about 360 days, 10% of the year. We do this strict fast and we offer this to Christ because we don't really struggle very hard for the whole year. Then we take this beautiful time of the year where now that winter is almost gone and the snow is gone and listen to this second hymn, the most venerable pre-cleansing week of the sacred fast is now upon us. And while pre-announcing the coming of the spring, this coming Sunday, we have what? But we'll have more daylight. More daylight. That's what this is talking about. Yeah. This is saying that just like we're going to have more light in this spring, if we follow the fast and follow the Triodion discipline, then we will also have more light for our souls and bodies. Okay, so Mary was sick last week and I didn't go to visit her. See, that is... Awful. I okay. don't like visitors. But <laughs> yeah, but then I can't get the grace that I'm supposed to get, Mary. You know, when you visit, this is very important. You have to visit the sick. If we don't, and, and people say, well, you know, all I have to do is just visit the sick and uh, feed a few hungry people at the food bank, give them a few sandwiches, Yanni, after, if you have some food left over at the restaurant, instead of throwing it away, you just give it to some hung, I mean, hungry people and give a little bit of money to the homeless and that's it, your, your home, Scott you food, right? Off your list, Th that's right? it. You, know, you just, that's it. You check it off. I'm good. I'm good. It doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like that. Not random acts of kindness. I mean, we have to develop a burning heart, according to St. Isaac the Syrian, the heart that burns with love for our fellow men. And I tell you, we fail miserably. After studying and reading the perfection of love of the fourth century desert fathers, I feel like a barbarian. I was telling someone this morning all the way across the continents. After listening to Palladio's Lazaic history, he speaks about a Saint Serapion, Saint Serapion the Egyptian, who after he, after he purified himself, after he cleansed uh, his passions, he came to perfect love. And then he would sell himself as a slave to preach Christ. So Serapion, after he came to the state of perfect love, he couldn't stay at a monastery because he didn't want to own anything nothing at all. He sold everything he had. The only thing that he had on him was a sheet to cover himself. And that's why they called him Sindonios from the Greek word Sindoni. So Saint Sindonios goes to this family who were idolaters and they were Hollywood people. I'm sorry, they were act. They worked in theater. So he goes to the slave market and he allows them to buy him for 20 coins. So he takes the coins, puts them aside, and then they take him home. And then for the next five, six, seven years, he was an obedient slave to them. He was bought with his 20 coins and he served them like he would be serving Christ. Totally obedient, doing things for them, whatever they asked and he prayed unceasingly and prayed for them constantly. And the prayers that they were not doing, he did for them. The prostrations that they were not doing, he did for them. This is how he spent for five years in their home. And when we do this kind of thing, then God interferes. And when they were ready, he spoke to them about the love of Christ and the gospel. And they came to such contrition that all of them, they were all baptized. So after they were all baptized, they said, well, now we're going to set you free. You're no longer a slave. You can be a free man and you'll be here and we'll be treating you like our father. 
You are part of our family. And he says, well, now that you are baptized, I'm going to tell you who I am. I am not a slave. I purposely did this so I can help you a little bit. And here's your 20 coins. Take them back. Oh, please. No, no, no. You take them and give them to a poor person. No, no, I am. I cannot do alms with other people's money. This is your money. It belongs to you. So they pleaded with him and he said, no, it's time for me to go to another family. So they pleaded with him to just visit them once a year and guide them. And he agreed to that. And a little bit after that, he found out that a family in Sparta, a very nice family, I believe they were in a government position, some nice people with a lot of virtues, that there were Manichaeans. There was a heresy. It was a Gnostic heresy, Manichaeism. And it was the same heresy that St. Augustine was involved with before he was baptized. So he went all the way to Sparta, stayed with them for a few years, and he brought him back to orthodoxy. And then after that, he continued to just recycle himself like that. Now, when you compare the kind of love that we have today, we are in dire straits. The love of the many will grow cold. And this is a prophecy from Christ himself. We have abandoned our sick people to die by themselves. I know, I know there's directives and governments and all that, but that never happened before. It never happened before. It didn't happen 100 years ago, didn't happen 200 years ago, and it didn't happen 20 years ago. Yes, Natalia. Not weird, but you know, I think on a big scale, you're right about that. What about like, for example, there were leper colonies, and even though there were some holy people that would visit and not get sick, sometimes like a lot of people, I'm sure, didn't really visit. The, the church did not abandon them, Nectaria. There was always a chaplain there. There was a priest that was assigned to go there, and a priest was always there with the lepers. And I give you an example. About 20 years ago, we had a very saintly father outside of Athens called Father Evmenios. Father Evmenios was the spiritual son of Nikiforos, St. Nikiforos the leper. St. Nikiforos the leper, he had no ears, he had no nose. Leprous was really advanced with St. Nikiforos. But Evmenios, when he was in fact, a few years after that, Hansen discovered the, uh, the medicine, the antibiotic, and... Although he had leprosy, he was spared from disfigurement and uh, losing his limbs and his ears. And However, even though he could have left and go back to Crete, he stayed at that hospital of leprosy outside of Athens to serve the Brothers of Christ. That's Nikiforos? No, oh, the Evmenios. Other one. <laughs> Evmenios served Nikiforos. He was a spiritual son. Nikif Saint Nikiforos taught, taught him the unceasing prayer. He saw Saint Saint Nikiforos, although Saint Nikiforos was on a wheelchair and he was basically totally disabled, at nighttime he saw him lifted up in the air, like four or five feet in the air, while saying the prayer. And he saw this, and he made him his spiritual father, and he stayed there. So this Evmenios, after Saint Nikiforos' repose, stayed, and he had hundreds of spiritual children. So at some point, about 20 years ago, we had uh, an outbreak of hepatitis, and some doctors showed up at this second class hospital that was not visited very much. A lot of people were afraid they wouldn't go. There was a lot of nurses in this hospital and they were it was suggested for them to be vaccinated. Three nurses that were, were his spiritual children, his spiritual daughters, went to him and said, Father of Manios, what do you think? Should we also take the hepatitis vaccine? And I quote the words of the priest who took them from the supervisor of this hospital, who at that time was his spiritual daughter. This priest called Nectarios happened to be at the 40-day memorial of Evmenios in Athens. So this is how I got this information. So these three spiritual daughters go to Father Evmenios and say, should we take the vaccine? And this is how saints think, not by the logic of this world, they think with the grace of God. So he says, do you believe that the people that you are serving, their brothers and sisters of Christ, do you believe that these sick people in here, they are in the image of Christ? Well, of course we believe that. And his suggestion was, do not take the vaccine. And back then there was no masks. 
There was no gloves. Uh, they were inexistent. 20, 25 years ago in a hospital like that in Greece. They don't even have sheets today in some hospital. You have to take your own after the crisis. The end result. Months later, a lot of the sisters that were vaccinated, they all got sick. And these three sisters, <laughs> nothing happened to them. So the element of faith is very important in our life. Of course, Sunday is the Sunday of forgiveness, and we should not allow all these external things that were imposed on us to somehow affect the union of love. I know that we have differences of opinion about masks, about vaccines. We should put all that aside because on a final analysis, Christ is going to look for love and forgiveness. If we don't have those two, then we cannot possibly be recognized by Christ on that day. So when he says, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I was hungry and you fed me. All that presupposes faith and love. Without faith, you can't do any of the above. It presupposes all that. When we read this gospel this past Sunday of judgment, some people can get the impression that it's all about good works. Look, if we just did a lot, do a lot of good work, it's not about works. <laughs> works without faith do not save. And faith without works is dead, according to St. James. There's a little detail in the beginning of that Sunday gospel, the gospel of the judgment. The sheep go to the right. So what are the characteristics of the sheep? They're obedient. They follow the leader. They follow <laughs> the shepherd. They're calm. They are. They stay together. They are meek. They're humble. And the sheep are fruitful. They they you can they have the wool them. and uh, wool yes, and of course. Milking. Goat tastes pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <you can laughs> One time, I, w I was outside of Athens <laughs> and I was uh, in the company of this priest. And <laughs> you know, I said, "Wow, what a nice goat on that cliff." He says to me, it "Would be much more interesting in the oven." <laughs> <laughs> And then he calls his presbytera and he says, um, Presbytera, I have visitors from America. I, I want you to get lunch ready. We went to take them some CDs. We were delivering CDs of Father Athanasius Mithilineus. So we go to the priest's house and uh, what's on the table? The only food that I never ate from a time I was a small kid. Okra. Uh, what is it? <laughs> Bamyas. Yeah. Oh, Okra. Oh, and I'm like, yeah. I said, <laughs> they're like slugs? Yeah. yeah. I like it, man. Uh, well, um, <laughs> so I sit there and I'm like, now what do we do? There's nothing else on the table. I am not about to offend these people. So I'm just going to make my cross and eat. <laughs> so but they were extremely well cooked. They were yeah. done in the oven. They were dried, so there was no slug, no, uh, uh, no <laughs> slime. Yeah, okay, yeah. so they were good, and I ate my okra on that yeah, day. Then all you started eating okra. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Never again. Okay, another story from uh, the love of the fourth century desert fathers. A lay person came from Alexandria or somewhere, and he brought a beautiful bunch of grapes. And he goes to the first hermit, you know, on the side of the mountain. There was about a dozen of hermits. And he goes to the first hermit and says, Father, I brought these fresh grapes for you. And the father says, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And he sets them aside. So after the, uh, the person left, the elderly fathers thought, well, you know what? These such nice grapes. My neighbor up the street is a little bit older than I. I think he would enjoy them more than me. So he sends them up to his neighbor. That neighbor takes the bunch of grapes, looks at it, gives glory to God and says, you know what, why should I eat this? I would give it to my neighbor. And by night time, the bunch of grapes made the whole circle of the mountain untouched nectaria and he came back to the first owner and he gave glory to god and he ate it <laughs> <laughs> these are people that lived in the desert so as you can see this gospel has really nothing to do with just alms giving because if it was just about giving money and giving things and helping the sick and how do the monks do this they don't have anything this is not just about giving some material things it's about developing the love of christ
the highest of all virtues. So Christ, through this gospel, he's going straight to the fruit. He says, you were sheep. In other words, you followed my commandments. You followed the faith. So the purpose of what we do, coming to church, fasting, following the commandments, all the prayer services, if all these things do not get us to love our brother and forgive our brother, then we are fruitless and we will be treated like that fig tree on Holy Monday night. This was symbolic of the synagogue of the Jews, the Pharisees that we talked about last week, that older son who was religious on the outside. But the gospel, last week's gospel, the gospel of judgment is telling us if you don't care for your neighbor who's sick, if you don't care for the hungry and for the person in jail, if you don't care for the orphans, you don't have any of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Because the highest fruit of the Holy Spirit is what? St. Paul begins from the very bottom, which is abstinence or self-control. He starts from the bottom and he goes up. And all those nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, and then we end up with peace, joy, and love. And the highest one is not faith. Faith is only for this life. Faith will not be necessary in the other life. The scriptures will not be necessary in the other life. So as we go through the Triodion season, which once again will take us all the way to Holy Saturday night, the refrain is, Lord, I have sinned. Forgive me. Lord, I don't have any love. I don't have any faith. It's all this self-accusation, very characteristic of the tax collectors. I am a sinner. So why the word triodion? What does triodion stand for? Hymn songs. Triodion. Three hymns. <laughs> okay. Triodion, the word tria and Ode, or the. Now, what did we do tonight? We did the supplicatory canon of the Panagia. So, the early church used the odes of the Old Testament and the Psalms for of its worship service. They didn't have St. John of Damascus yet. They didn't have St. Cosmas, his stepbrother, Bishop of Mayoma. So, the church didn't have all these hymns. So the hymnal of the church, the apostolic church, were the odes of the Old Testament, eight of them, and the ninth ode, which you heard tonight. So our hymnographers composed what we call canons. A canon is a long prayer service, the supplicatory canon of the Panagia, which has how many odes? Nine. We also have the canon of the Akathist, which also has nine odes. The first eight odes are from the Old Testament, and the first ode is the hymn written by Moses after Pharaoh was drowned in the Red <coughs> Sea. And that's why it talks about the Red Sea. Kimati Thalassi's Holy Friday Night, the canon of Holy Friday Night, starts like that. By the waves of the sea, the Pharaoh was drowned after that miracle of the Red Sea. So we always commemorate in the first ode, in all these canons, we commemorate Moses and the defeat of Pharaoh who's representing the devil in the Red Sea. See the second ode, also by Moses, but it is so solemn and he has so many curses that our church fathers don't use it very often. They just skip it because it talks about all these evils that will come upon Israel if they neglect their faith and if they abandon the Lord. I don't want to say curses, but just punishment if you choose to go away from God. This is where the second ode is coming from. And I saw a little bit of it in the Triodion, but it's not used very often. So you'll find out that in our services, we go from the first ode and then we skip to the third. The third ode is from Anna, who could not have any children. And one day she went to the temple and she was praying like she was drunk. She was praying with an unceasing prayer to the Lord. And one of the priests thought that she was drunk and explained to him, no, no, I, I am really hurting because I need to have a child. And a year later, she had a child and she dedicated that child to the temple. And that's where we got Samuel the prophet. So that third ode comes 
from the praise of Anna after she became pregnant and after God gave her a child. The fourth ode from Avakum. Who's Avakum? Yanni. Right, Prophet Avakum, one of the lesser prophets who wrote less things, who foresaw the coming of Christ and many other things about the life of Christ. The fifth old prophet Isaiah. And Prophet Isaiah is like the fifth evangelist. He wrote about the resurrection like he was seeing it, like he was there. The sixth ode, and I think that was the Sunday school lesson last Sunday, it was about Jonah, who was in the whale for three days, and the hydrochloric acid of the whale, which is one of the strongest acids. Fish have a very, very acidic stomach. I mean, they dissolve everything. And Jonah was there for three days, symbolizing and prefiguring the three days of Christ in the tomb. So the sixth ode always refers to Jonah. This is in the Irmos, the, the Irmos, the Hermos, the beginning hymn of the ode. It's not usually chanted, but if you read it, you'll see the name of Jonah in there, even in the Paraclesis of the Panagia. I was kind of trying to find them all while we're doing the Paraclesis. So even the name of Jonah will be in there on the Irmos. The seventh ode is the prayer of the three youths in the furnace, the three youths in the fire that were not afraid from the threats of Nebuchadnezzar. And while everybody else, even many of their countrymen, went down to worship that statue, and they could have said, well, look, let's just kneel and let's not pray to that statue. Let us kneel and pray to our God. They could have done that. No. Because everybody else that would see them, they would say, no, even, even these boys of Israel, they even denied their God and they refused to bow down. Ananias, Azarias, and Mishael. And remember how we chant their hymns on Holy Saturday morning. The seventh ode is the prayer of these three youths, but they don't say, Lord, we have been good. Why are you punishing us? No, all of us. All Israel has sinned, and we deserve to die. We have gotten away from you. They took the sins of their people on them. They were accusing themselves. See so where humility and love go together? If you have love, you have humility. The two go together. And this is why these people in the gospel said, Lord, when did we see you hungry? We don't remember any of the thing, these things that you're talking about. You see their humility, their humble person does something good and forgets about it, writes it off. They forgot everything because they were humble, because they didn't think their works were worth anything. They were so humble. Where on the other hand, the other people who had no humility whatsoever, they began to accuse Christ. Where did we see you when we didn't feed you? We don't remember any of that. We never saw you anywhere. We would have seen you. Yeah, we would have given you food. But you never appear to us. Okay, so the eighth ode is the praises after they were saved. Okay. The, the, uh, the seventh was their prayer to God. Like, we have sinned. We acknowledge our sins. If we're going to be burned, that's fine. We deserve it. But the eighth ode is after they were saved. Then when we chant, And then the ninth ode is from the New Testament at the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary, when the Virgin Mary goes to Elizabeth and the Holy Spirit begins to speak through the Panagia and Elizabeth, and the Panagia says, Megalini ipsihimu ton kirion, my soul magnifies the Lord. That's the ninth ode. But in the Triodio now, we don't have the nine odes. We have a lot of little canons with three odes. That's where we get the Triodion. So we have a lot of hymns with three odes, and they jump around. They, they will do first, third, seventh. And then they'll go second, fifth, ninth. It's a lot of little canons. They will have all these triodes. And where we get the word Triodion. Yeah.
Dios, Dios. 